Good evening, and welcome to another episode of the Prince Hall Think Tank, a monthly conversation amongst Prince Hall Freemasons where we discuss topics relative to craft masonry. My name is Brother Antonio Caffey, and I'm a very proud past master of March Lodge Number 7, located in Columbus, Ohio, where Worshipful Brother Vance Williams served as Worshipful Master. My lodge was granted a charter in 1852 by the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Ohio, where currently the Honorable Chester C. Christie serves as Most Worshipful Grand Master. Before I let the other brothers and our special guests introduce themselves this evening, I'd like to state, as always, that the views and opinions that are expressed by us tonight in no way reflect the views and opinions of the lodges and Grand Lodges in which we hold membership in. Also, if you have any questions, please feel free to utilize the chat option on our YouTube page. And if we have time at the end of the conversation, we will try to answer some of them. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page so that you can stay up to date with all things Think Tank. At this time, I'll let our regular panelists introduce themselves first, followed by our special guest, Brother Morgan. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Past Master James R. Morgan III coming to you right from outside of Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. I have the honor of being a Past Master of Corinthian Lodge Number 18, which operates under the auspices of the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia, where the Honorable Quincy G. Gant is presiding as our Grand Master. All is well here in Freemasonry in the nation's capital. I uh, hope that everyone's staying safe and uh, slowly but surely coming out of our long hibernation as we're getting into this very, very hot summer. Uh, definitely want to send my prayers down to those uh, in, 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 or anyone who has family down in there uh, in, uh, in Florida right now with that situation uh, for sure. But uh, hopefully tonight we can, uh, can, can have some fun and as always learn something. Definitely. Brother Jack. Good evening to all, um, Brother Damian Jack, uh, proud past master of Paul Drayton Lodge Number no. Seven here in Charlotte, North Carolina, where Brother Sean Moy serves as our worshipful master. Our lodge is a constituent lodge under the auspices of the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge, free and accepted Masons of North Carolina's jurisdiction incorporated, where the Honorable Daniel L. D. T. Thompson serves as our twenty-fourth Most Worshipful Grand Master. It is an honor and pleasure to be with you this evening. As always, thank you for taking your time. To be with us this evening, and we pray that you enjoy the show. Thanks, your brother, brother Gillarm. All right, good evening, I'm brother Dave Gillarm. I'm a past master of Mount Pisgah Lodge, number fifty-three, located in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, our lodge was chartered December twenty-first, eighteen eighty-eight, and I and our worship master, brother Brandon Dura. Uh, I also have the pleasure of serving as the uh, worship grand historian of the most worship prince hall grand lodge of Georgia. Or Honorable Corey Shackleford Sr. serves our 18th Grand Master. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm looking forward to tonight's discussion. Thanks, Brother Gillon. And our special guest this evening, Brother Powers. Please introduce yourself to the audience. Good evening. Uh, it's a true pleasure to be here. Alex Powers, uh, Past Master Gardner Lodge 65, Gardner, Kansas. Currently serving as Area Deputy Grand Master for Area 9 and Director of Kansas Lodge Research under the Grand Lodge of Kansas. Thank you uh, so much for having me here, gentlemen. Uh, thank you, brother. Thank you for joining us. We're looking forward to the conversation this evening. You know, many of our lodges recently um, are in the process of celebrating St. John's Day, which is a tradition within Freemasonry that dates back hundreds of years. So this evening, we're gonna discuss the Holy St. John who they were, what they mean to craft masonry, and how we choose to recognize them. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. Brother Powers. Yeah, St. John's Day, or St. John's Day, I should say, in Freemasonry, uh, it's, it's an interesting concept. Um, obviously, St. John the Evangelist and Baptist were dubbed the patron saints of uh, Freemasonry um, far before we really have written record to. Um, we see them utilized before the Grand Lodge system came into being, and we see them continue to be uh, utilized strongly into the modern day today. Uh, we find some really cool references, um, especially in old Scottish masonry of actually St. John's lodges. Uh, and one thing that we know is when the Grand Lodge came together is that 
the two main purposes besides bringing uh, construction to the the ritual itself or or likeness across the board um, was to make sure two things happen and that was to celebrate the feast of the saint john's and to bury our dead so historically we see that on these days masonic lodges would gather to uh, together and celebrate in the manner of a table lodge a festive board um, and have a feast together break bread together around the memory of our saints john interestingly enough you bring it into modern day um and obviously they're Christianized saints. So we see a lot of times in modern day lodges now celebrate Saints John by, by traveling to a, uh, a church together and, and attending uh, service of worship as a lodge. Uh, our jurisdiction this year, Most Worshipful, uh, actually deemed that we could not do that as a lodge, as, at least as our official act of observance for St. John's Day, um, and that we were to celebrate or observe uh, that celebration in the manner of a traditional feast, um, being that of a table lodge or a festive board. And it had to include the seven toasts. Uh, so I thought that was quite interesting. And all of our lodges here in our jurisdiction uh, had some pretty great uh, events around that this year. And, you know, it was really neat to see lodges get back to those historical roots. At least in our jurisdiction, uh, that of a table lodge or a festive board is usually something that you see on a grand lodge scale. Not many lodges actually observe them very often. Uh, so it was pretty cool to see all the lodges, or at least the mass majority, they were all supposed to uh, take on that observation this year. And they did a pretty good job at it as well. I, I attended a few myself and uh, had a great time there. Um, but historically, we see that they are very important, both allegorical and uh, conceptual into the the craft masonry and the question is what was the original connection and uh and why has that lasted so long now i didn't personally set up a uh a presentation around this i'm, I'm here more to uh to talk with you gentlemen so um i would be open to defer that on and, and jump into the conversation as seen fit definitely you know and i think you you bring up a great point regarding just the, um, you know, the differences. And I think within masonry, at least in my opinion, the word differences is is sometimes frowned upon. And to me, it's one of the, the, the best things that I like about the craft are, are the, the, the differences that exist between lodges, jurisdictions, different things as far as um, how we, conduct business, you know, as long as, you know, we do have our set rules, like you have to do this, you have to do this. But I think we do have some flexibility with how we um, conduct business. So, you know, do, do you think that with, with the Grand Master Day this year within your jurisdiction, do you think that's going to be the, the tradition moving forward? Or do you see, you know, a possible rollback depending on who's in that chair? You know, so it's hard to say. Um, in, in our jurisdiction, at least, this came out in the manner of being a, uh, a grandmaster's interpretation of the rule. Uh, so in that case, being a stated interpretation, it would remain as such um, until a further grandmaster would reinterpret it and release that. Um, so do I see it happening in the near future that it's reinterpreted? Probably not. I, I see that ex expectation of it um, sticking around for some time. Uh, personally, I, I think it's it's a good thing on the fact of being on the level uh, as a lodge, right? Um, it's kind of a, a double-edged sword topic, right? Because they are Christianized saints, but as far as a lodge having its official act um, as attending a worship service, traditionally in this area, that's going to be of a Christian church. If you have Jewish Muslim brothers uh, within your, your lodge's body, um, then that becomes not so much on the level to to make your lodge's observance uh, to be that of a, uh, attending a service worship together uh, in that classified means of dogma, um, but to get together and break bread as, as a lodge on a, a level basis around a traditional aspect of the feast, um, which we're intended to do to start with, I think is the more appropriate manner to go about. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. It, it can it can definitely you know which you know I'm sure we'll we'll see and we'll we'll discuss too. It can be um, a tricky thing, and and I, I'm already anticipating some of the questions that we're gonna get 
uh, in the chat later on <laughs> regarding uh, regarding the observance and, and some of the and some of the traditional ways that that um, some of our lodges and jurisdictions uh, celebrate uh, St. John's Day. So, Indeed. Brother Jack. Yes, sir. Jump into your presentation, good brother. Yes, sir. While we're waiting for Brother Jack's presentation to load up, uh, Brother Kathy, I want to piggyback on something you just said, which is to remind everybody to make sure that you're dropping your questions and comments in the chat on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, wherever, wherever you're watching this so we can uh, get to you in the Q&A. Uh, we know that this is going to be a jam-packed episode and we don't want to miss your input. All right, uh, Brother Brother Jack, you ready to go? Uh, yes, sir. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. All right. All right, everyone. So this evening, I want to give a um, brief discussion on the the Holy Saints John's. Uh, my overview is to discuss uh, John the Baptist, uh, discuss who who he was, and since um, Brother Powers, at you know, eloquently stated um, the fact that you know, I think a, a lot of times we uh, when we do John the Baptist and John the Evangelist, uh, a lot of a lot of it is. Uh, uh, I want to say I'll say Christianize as as he say I want to discuss how John the Baptist is is viewed and and revered uh, within different faiths. Um, seeing as how you know in Freemasonry we do not adopt a particular creed, so I do want to discuss that as far as John the Baptist is concerned. Um, as far as John the Evangelist, we're going to discuss who he was and what he taught, and then at the end uh, talk about how uh, both of them and what they have done ties into uh, Freemasonry. So to start out. Who was exactly was John the Baptist? Uh, John the Baptist uh, was the son of Zechariah, who was one of the uh, 12 minor prophets. Um, John the Baptist was known as living a simple life, meaning his he was known by the clothes that he wore. He wore uh, his clothes was made of camel's hair and he wore a leather belt um, around his, his loins. Um, he was known for, you know, eating simple things like locusts and honey, which is found uh, in the book of Matthew, chapter three, verse verse four, uh, John the Baptist was known as a as a preacher and a prophet. Uh, his ministry consists of talking about God's final judgment. Uh, started by talking about repentance through the process of baptism, uh, and he was known for challenging sinful uh, rulers. For the uh, most part, uh, he was a threat to uh, King Herod Antipas, um, who um, ultimately. Um, had him um, arrested and uh, executed by beheading. So uh, when you talk about uh, different different faiths, there are different, you know, John the Baptist in view, is viewed uh, different ways. So uh, within the uh, Christian faith, uh, John the Baptist is, is known as the forerunner or precursor of Jesus. As it says in Malachi 3 and 1, uh, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are uh, seeking uh, will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. And in Matthew 3 and 11 says, I baptize you with water for repentance. Uh, but after me comes one who was more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Um, and this is said to have come from John the Baptist himself. Within the Islamic faith, um, he has he is known as uh, and, I, and forgive me if I get the pro, uh, the pronunciation wrong, but he is known as uh, Yaha Yahya or Yahye, uh, which is uh, which means God is gracious. Um, his birth was foretold by angel to Gabriel in the third sword uh, in the third sword verses thirty nine, where it says so the angels called out to him when he stood praying in the sanctuary. Allah gives you good news of the birth of John, who will con firm the word of Allah and will be a great leader, chaste, and a prophet among the righteous. Now, this comes from um, his, his father, Zechariah, who uh, was, was praying to uh, to have a son, and his, and his um, answers, his prayers were answered um, by the angels. Uh, he was considered a prophet of the righteous, as told in the sixth surah, verse 85. Likewise, we got it, Zechariah, John, Jesus, and Elias, who were all of the righteous. And he is, uh, John the Baptist is considered to be the bridge between Islam and Christianity. Now, he's also um, known within the Baha'i faith. Now, those who don't know, um, may not know what the Baha'i faith is. 
Uh, the Baha beliefs address essential themes as the oneness of God and religion, the oneness of humanity and freedom of prejudice, the inherent nobility of human being, the progressive revelation of religious truth, the development of spiritual qualities, the integration of worship and service, the fundamental equality of the sexes, the harmony between religion and science, the centrality of justice and to all human endeavors, the importance of education, and the dynamics of the relationship that are to bind together individuals, communities, institutions, as humanity advances toward its collective maturity. Now, there is a parallel when it comes to um, John, uh, John the Baptist and this faith. So where the comparison comes in is that there is um, uh, the, the founder is known as uh, Baha'u'llah and uh, he is, there was one person that was, that came before him who they call Bob. Now, Bob, they could uh, be a B. Now, uh, Bob was considered to be the, uh, the forerunner of Baha'u'llah. And so they uh, tie him to be John the Baptist, who they say was the, as we say is the, is the forerunner or the precursor of Christ. So, um, Bob is the, the one who started to spread the, 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 the faith of, of Baha'i. And be, because of what he was doing, he was he was arrested and Baha'u'llah Baha basically took took over. And so because of that, they call Bob the, the precursor or the forerunner and basically um, saying that he uh, was John the Baptist as he is the forerunner of what was to come for the founder of the um, of the Baha'i faith. So they believe that in, you know, within their faith that John the Baptist has, has already has already come. And so they use him in that in that parallel between um, the founder and the forerunner and, and what they use now. And continuing, they feel that the Baha'i faith feels that that those who continue uh, to follow the, the, the teachings and, and, and the revelations of John the Baptist have. Uh, they refer to as um, Mandaism. Now, Mandaism is a uh, monotheistic and Gnostic religion. The word derives from the word manda, meaning knowledge. They are also identified with Sabians. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sabians come from the root word sabah, which is Aramaic, meaning baptism. Um, <clears throat> as we know in the uh, Christian faith, uh, when you are baptized, you are baptized once. But then the uh, um, Mandaism uh, faith, you can be baptized several times in your life. And so they use, um, and of course you're, you're baptized by water. And they feel that water comes from the world of lights and perceived as uh, a source of life. In Mandaism, they believe, they believe in the salvation of the soul through the esoteric knowledge of God. And so they consider uh, John the Baptist to be the last and greatest prophet almost to the point where they have their second most important book uh, in, May, in um, Mandaism known as John's, John's Instructions or the, or the Book of John. Um, and basically where everything that, um, that, is, that was taught by, by John the Baptist, they, um, they basically follow and uh, revere and put John, John the Baptist on, um, on that pedestal. What you see um, on the right is um, the, Man, the Mandaean cross, um, the the four the the four corners um, of the cross represents the four corners of the universe. Um, the white silk cloth rep, uh, represents the light of God, and you have the uh, the the seven the seven points of the leaf. So this is what uh, uh, another faith um, that that reveres uh, John the Baptist, and once again that is Mandaism. Now. There are those who um, who believe in it as said that John the Baptist received uh, his teachings or his teaching style from from the Essenes. Now, many of many of us have um, may have heard of the Essenes before. I know that in the uh, ritual in, here in North Carolina, we say that the you know initiation and everything is is derived from from the Essenes. Now, the Essenes were the third religious sect along with the Pharisee um, and, Sar and uh, Sadducee. Um, they thought themselves as to be the light which shines into darkness and which invites darkness to change into light. They believed in three, there were, there were three types of souls, uh, sleeping, drowsy, and awakened. 
Uh, they believe that their purpose was to relieve the, the sleeping souls, try to awaken the drowsy souls, drowsy souls, and welcome and God awaken souls. And the only ones who were allowed to join the Essenes and, and participate in the initiations of becoming an Essene were those who were considered, whose souls were considered to be awakened. And part of their initiation was the purification um, and washing of one's feet, hands, and body. So they believe that the um, the the teachings of uh, John the Baptist uh, may have derived from uh, from him being in the scene. So now moving forward to John the Evangelist. Now John the Evangelist um, is not widely uh, used within and other faiths. He is mainly known within the uh, within the Christian faith. Um, he is also known as John 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 the Apostle and John the uh, the Divine. He was one of the twelve uh, apostles. Uh, and and considered to be the uh, beloved uh, apostle. Um, he is said to have been the writer of the Gospel of John, uh, the epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and also the, the book of Revelation. And he is um, he was known for spreading uh, spreading the gospel, which at the time was not called uh, was not called Christianity, but it was actually called the way, being as how in um, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and, and the life. So those during that time were considered followers of the way. So he was um, spreading the gospel of the way, as it was called um, at that time. So how does um, John the Baptist and John the Evangelist tie into Freemasonry? Now, I know uh, Brother Morgan is going to go into a different uh, into a different aspect. So tonight I wanted to basically discuss um, the behaviors. As we know, uh, as, as Masons, we are familiar with the symbol that you see uh, to your right, and we know that being the, the boundary of conduct. So I wanted to discuss as far as the conduct. We know that John the Baptist mainly discussed uh, repentance. Webster's Dictionary uh, defined, defines repentance as reviewing one's actions and feeling contrition or regret for past wrongs, which is accompanied by commitment to and actual actions that show and prove a change for the better. So, when we talk about when you talk about that, and we talk about what uh, that symbol on the on the right represents, we talk about re, you know reviewing your actions and showing by your actions that you are making a change for the better. You can look at the the um, the working tools that we had that you have received, the lessons within Freemasonry, which talks about um, improving yourself, making yourself um, making yourself better. And and the the lessons in, in order for you to do so. So in 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 that sense, you're you're looking at and, and becoming better. You're looking at basically what what you have done wrong, what it is, um, how you can basically cut off those cut off those things that that have caused you to do wrong and make yourself better. For John the Evangelist, we you know he mainly talked about not only did he spread the gospel, but he mainly talked about love. An example on um, brotherly love, as says in First John uh, four seven and eight. Dear friends, let us love one another, for God, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love God does not know God, because God is love. And also, he talked about truth, and we know truth being a divine attribute. He said, God is light; in Him there is no darkness. If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in, in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. And basically within, especially within uh, the book of 1 John, it basically talks about how your actions should ma match your words. So if you say that you uh, if you say that you love God, but do not love your brother, then you're living a lie. And you're not living in truth. So basically your words should should match your, your actions. And we know love being um, an action verb. So he said throughout in order for you to basically live in truth and we talk about truth, your actions have to match your words. Notice how I said your actions should match your words and not your words should match your actions because we know that in Freemasonry it's all about it's all about action. So when you look at the um the who we consider the patron saints, the two holy saints Johns, we, we talk about in 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 changing our behavior and becoming better and showing that by our actions we are becoming better people, not just for ourselves, but everyone who is around us, our homes, our family, our community. And these are the examples of how we can we can do so. Uh, these are just some of my sources that I use 
uh, to come up with to today's presentation. And I want to give a big thank you to uh, my friend who I had a, a great uh, conversation with um, yesterday and helping me come up with um, this uh, presentation. Um, he has always been uh, a good friend. He has uh, served uh, the jurisdiction of North Carolina well. Um, he is a uh, past most excellent grand high priest, uh, Bishop Robert Diedrich Hood. Um, I want to thank you, my friend, for the great discussion that uh, we had yesterday. And thank you for the knowledge and wisdom that you imparted to me to give this presentation. Um, everyone, this is my presentation. I, I pray that you have enjoyed. Um, and there are some uh, great information that has come from that. So thank you so much. Thank you, Brother Jack. It was a great, great presentation. And I think it, it looks like it produced some some questions in, in the uh, the comments section, which I'm, I'm sure we'll we'll get to um, uh, as, as we always do. Uh, Brother Morgan, you're up. Moi? OK, yes. no problem, no problem. Well, let me uh, go ahead and load up my uh, presentation here. I mean, you guys you know, have a funny way of sticking me, you know, after after uh, Damien comes in, clean up the house. Yeah, yeah exactly. I'm the clean up, exactly. I'm the clean, I'm the clean up man. Clean exactly. up man. Clean, clean, clean up man. Clean up man. <laughs> yeah. So let me so let me get on into this, and uh, let's let's see. Let's enjoy whatever happens. Okay. Um, so the title of this presentation is um, the Celestial Circle of Life. And uh oh. Um, one moment. Okay, can you, you all can see that, right, uh, yep. Brother Kathy? Yeah. All right, very good. Okay. So this presentation is going to touch on um, some things that are very much related to Freemasonry, in my view, but some things that, and on the surface, you're going to look and go, Bro where's Brother Morgan going with this? What is he talking about? Okay. Um, and so I just ask that you all bear with me as we take a quick walk through uh, the celestial circle of life, okay? So when you think of the circle of life, at least when I think of the circle of life, I think of this movie right here, okay? Uh, the Lion King. Uh, and as you can see, I don't own the rights to the Lion King, or, nor do I claim to, or any other Disney property. But, but that song, the circle of life, is something that really struck me as I was thinking about the important place that circles have within Freemasonry. I mean, our very uh, emblem of the square and the compass, the compass itself evokes the idea of circles, okay? Um, and so when I think of the Lion King and I think of that song, The Circle of Life, you know, something struck me because I was putting this presentation together that I hope that you all will see. So if, so if you don't know how the Lion King relates to Freemasonry, right now that's okay but my hope is that at the end of this presentation you might have a better idea of where brother morgan was coming from with this uh this evening okay so um we're going to talk a little bit about saintly symbology i want to give a shout out to brother kathy and his remarkable uh, uh artistic skills for this uh wonderful uh representation of the uh of the saint john the baptist and saint john the evangelist um as inner apprentices we are taught that in every regular well-governed lodge, there's supposed to be symbolized a certain point within a circle that is bounded by the two lines representing these two saints, which Brother Jack so eloquently uh, already described to us in his presentation and gave us some background history on them. Um, Brother Powers also gave us some really important information on the practice of St. John's Day as well. Um, I'm going to go a different direction with it tonight, though. I want to talk a little bit about the symbolism behind this symbol itself. Let's talk about the meaning and discern what is this uh, symbol supposed to be teaching us, okay, as Freemasons. So uh, every Mason is supposed to know our boundaries, which we are supposed to designate as being the St. John the Baptist, St. John the Evangelist. We look to their lives as being representations of the lives that good men should leave, should lead, Okay, and so we're taught uh, typically that the point represents the individual brother and the circle represents the bounds through, through which he will not cross or he will strive not to cross as he is ever working his way to perfecting himself in the eyes of the grand architect of the universe. We also see the grand architect symbolized by the existence of the 
um, volume of sacred law, which represents divine law, divine will, and divine intelligence of said grand architect. Okay. Now we're going to talk, we're going to get into some real, real heavy stuff. So I hope you all are taking notes. Now, all symbols by definition have at least two interpretations, the literal interpretation and the symbolic one, which the creator of that symbol or the person using the symbol is trying to communicate. Okay. So whereas words communicate directly the intent of the person speaking, symbols exist to communicate complex ideas in a very simple package. Okay. Oftentimes, and we should notice as Masons that oftentimes that symbols have more than two, but at least by definition, symbols have at the very least two meanings. Okay. According to Brother William S. Burkle of Scioto Lodge Number no. Six and under the Grand Lodge of Ohio, uh, he uh, he wrote a paper about the point within a circle, which is called uh, the point within a circle, more than just an illusion. Uh, and he, uh, Brother Burkle, actually talks about it from a uh, astronomical point of view. And this paper is is one that I read uh, many years ago when I first joined the craft. Uh, uh, over a decade ago now, but it's one that really sat with me. And if you'll bear with me just one moment, um, I would like to read to you just a short snippet of it. Um, so to illustrate to you the impact that this had on me, so you can so, so set up the, the following information I'm going to bring to you. Brother Burkle states, quote, in the course of my inquiry, I found several explanations alluding to the point within the circle symbolism. Uh, including one which pointed out that the Feast of the Two Saints Johns are separated by six months' time, and that the symbol of the point within a circle is a sort of miniature or, or ori, showing the path of the earth around the sun, with the feast designating the winter and summer solstices. Now, for those who don't know what an ori is, an ori is a mechanical device that's utilized to represent the rotation of the sun, the moon, and planets, and other celestial bodies. OK, another explanation liken the circle to an astronomical or astrological diagram complete with astro astrological symbols arranged about the circle or circumference and which held that the vertical lines were representative of the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. Yet another variation, the explanation of the point within a circle also identified the vertical lines as signifying the two Saints John's, but expounded upon the significance of the volume of sacred law in the symbol and offered an exhaustive discussion of chapters and verses within the Bible attributed to St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist, all of which alluded to the point within a circle representing the God, representing God and man, respectively. A further version was discovered which ignored the vertical lines, but which asserted that the, that the point within a circle was the monad and represented God, meaning that the point within a circle itself represents the oneness of deity, okay? So we're going to look at this. There's a number of interpretations. We're going to look at this from a scientific, astronomical, and a historical perspective tonight, and I hope you all uh, enjoy. So as I mentioned earlier, an ORI is simply just a model of the solar system. Um, you know, many of us in elementary school, I know I did, we had one, uh, you know, in our science classrooms. I used to love playing with it personally. Um you know, uh, back then Pluto was considered a planet. Now it's, I'm told Pluto is no longer a planet, but we won't get into that right now. <laughs> but in any event, um, our understanding of time is very much likened, or very much linked to our understanding of the movement of celestial bodies. And so you see here the illustrations that I chose to use shows a, a mechanical device that uh, is representing the solar system and uh, various bodies that exist within it. And then you see a, a simple wristwatch, right, or the, or the mechanism for a wristwatch. Um, think about that, circu that circuitous motion that the hands of a clock make. Why, why did clockmakers initially use a circle? Why not a triangle? Why not a square? Why not a trapezoid? But they use a circle to represent the classical form of a watch that we think of. You know, I know there's different models, but the classical form of a watch is uh, circular in its shape. And there's a reason for that. It's, it is a miniaturized version of representing the celestial uh, motions uh, in the heavens. OK, now I want to talk to you all about a film that I find very fascinating. Uh, and again, I don't own the rights to it, nor do I claim to. But this film is called Agora. If you haven't checked it out, I, I highly recommend it as almost, I would say, required viewing for any 
um, Mason or Sister of the Eastern Star, anyone interested in these topics. Um, very, very fascinating film. Um, it is uh, a historical, it's based in, his, in history. The, the story it tells is, is somewhat fictitious, but it's based in history, okay? And it deals with th this actress, Rachel Weiss. Uh, she's playing the role of Hypatia. Uh, if anyone, if you're not familiar with Hypatia, that's okay. I'm, I've got your cliff notes for you right here. So Hypatia was a woman of Greek descent, born in Alexandria, Egypt. She was the daughter of Theon. Uh, uh, of Alexandria, a noted scholar and mathematician in his own right. Hypatia is raised in Egypt during the period when Rome is going through great political and religious turmoil. Uh, during her lifetime, Rome converts from being from its pre-Christian past formally to becoming formally a Christian empire. During her lifetime, she she witnesses this. Hypatia is considered by many to be the last of the in the line of the sort of classical philosophers going back to uh in the greek tradition uh aristotle plato uh going back to uh uh you know all uh an uh, uh, all all these different uh thinkers who folks are forced to study in high school and college um she's considered kind of the last in that line um and the story that is told in this film centers around a couple of ideas one of which is her battling with the religious extremism that the forced conversion of the Roman Empire to Christianity, what does that do to religious extremism during that time period? And the, the, the lack of, um, of tolerance of other religions, particularly Jews, as well as the uh, those who were practicing the ancient worship of the Greeks and the Egyptians, okay? Um, which Hypatia doesn't fall into really any of those categories because Hypatia is a philosopher, she's a scientist. Right, uh, which some in, in, in her period would look at as almost being witchcraft, right? Or literally witchcraft. Um, the other subtext of this story, however, and why I chose these two images is that Hypatia in the film spends much of her life trying to figure out the movement of the of the heavenly bodies, which in the film they call wanderers, but in, in that which was what they were known to the Greeks in ancient times, but today we know them as planets and moons or what have you. Um, and she spends years and years trying to understand their movement, okay? Um, and this, these are just some, some basic notes for, uh, of what I just said here. Um, but one of the things, the thing that I want you to understand here at the, the, uh, the second to last point is that Hypatia eventually recognizes and realizes, and you can see the, the, the still from the scene here, that she spent all this time trying to prove or understand the circle, the circular motion of the orbit of the various planets. And then one day she realizes that it's in fact elliptical. Okay. Meaning that an, an ellipse is a, is a sort of um, um, morphed uh, version of a circle, right? Kind of an elongated circle, but it is, it's in that same family. And so in the film, Hypatia, I'm sorry for spoiling it for anyone who's, who hasn't seen the film, but Hypatia spends a lot of time uh, uh, on this, particular mathematical and scientific problem of her day. And even though she herself was not a Mason, um, I, I believe that there are people who may not be formally members of Freemasonry or Eastern Star or what have you, Rosicrucians, what have you, but anyone who's in those organizations can look at their life, look at their work and see the connection or see that that person had that same, uh, came in kind of that same uh, spirit, so to speak. And so for me, once again, this film was just, as, as a Mason, this, this film was fascinating for me to, 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 to watch. And I have it on DVD here. I actually borrowed the DVD long term from uh, from Brother Tahuti Evans. So uh, if y'all see him, don't tell him I told you that. <laughs> uh, moving forward, uh, Hypatia, unfortunately, uh, met a, a an unkind end. She was, uh, the film depicts this, and this is a, also a famous story from uh, from classical history that Hypatia was actually assaulted during one of the raids of the uh, Christian radicals during that period in Alexandria, where they were attacking the library in Alexandria, where she once worked and, and studied. Um, and she's actually um, murdered. And this is a very famous image depicting that, um, her, her, her murder, um, which is, you know, uh, you know it's, it's sad because with her death, many people would conclude that that was the end of sort of classical learning, classical scientific knowledge, um, you know, until, you know, which leads into the, uh, the, mid the middle ages, 
uh, as is known in Europe. But we know that that wasn't the case everywhere. But that this is kind of the narrative that is that is portrayed, right? Now, let's talk about the, the from the African perspective, uh, the Bakongo Cosma brand, okay, also known as the Tindwa Inza Congo, okay. This is a, another version of what I call a circle of life. As Brother Jack mentioned earlier, uh, talking about the cross when he was dealing with, uh, with I believe it was mandism. If, I'm not, if, I, if I don't want to mispronounce it, Brother Jack, please correct me when I'm done if I, if I, if I did. Um, but you see here the cross. The cross is a very sacred symbol, not just to Christianity, but even in classical uh, and in um, medieval West Africa, uh, West Africa as well, because the idea of the cross being the crossroads of life, your choices, right? Um, in this particular context, the cosmogram uh, represents the, literally the cycle of life as understood in West Central Africa, okay? Uh, you have on your far right, birth manifesting, at, uh, which is also represented by sunrise, then you have the height of your physical power as a human being, which is represented by the sun's movement at noon. Then you have the evening hours, which represents the physical death. And then at the bottom there, you see where the sun is at midnight or what is known as the peak of your ancestral and spiritual powers. But here's the kicker of this particular cosmology is that after midnight, you come back once again and are reborn in one of your descendants. And so, you know, even in this context, you know, I think of uh, the use of uh, the sprig of acacia in Freemasonry to remind us of the immortality of the soul. Um, you know, again, we see this, we see this same circle of life uh, being manifested in the, uh, in, in this classical African symbol, okay? Um, and here you can see see this illustration once again, and I, I left some notes there for anyone who wants to take notes on the re, on the uh, the replay here. Um, but just remember that the the circle of life um, is intimately linked to the solar cycle in West African culture, particularly among the Congo people, Congolese people, uh, intimately connected with the concept of the movement of the sun. That's how how they symbolize life. OK, so when we think going back all the way to the first slide, the circle of life, I'm not going to sing the song because I can't sing. But when you think about that song, what were they really communicating? What were they really trying to say to us about the very nature of life? And when you think about that, 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 that picture in my first slide where Rafiki is holding a young Simba, holding him up at Pride Rock. Why did I include that? I included that because Simba is being hit with sunlight that the sun being the being the primary circle of life on this very planet and even those who I, I didn't include this but for those who've seen roots there's even a scene where uh uh um kunta kente's father takes him out as a baby and pulls him up to the universe and in that particular film it's at night but he, he tells him he says behold kunta kente you know the only thing greater than yourself and shows him the universe shows him all the celestial spheres right so, so, so understand that from time immemorial, man has oftentimes contemplated the very nature of the universe to understand the nature of ourselves, or as some would say, as above, so below. Moving forward, here's another uh, very, very interesting person who, who dealt to uh, some degree with, with the, uh, uh, the circles of life. Uh, Benjamin Banneker. Now I want to pause here and I'm going to say it and once I'm going to say it again. I, don't, I know I don't want nothing getting started. Benjamin Banneker was not a Freemason, was not a Prince Hall Mason, uh, at least not to our knowledge. <laughs> uh, there were no lodges uh, in his area of Maryland that were accepting black men at that time, particularly no Prince Hall lodges. And so he so he was not a Mason in the in the in the sense that that that, that we understand it. But there's definitely things about Benjamin Banneker's life and work that I think resonate with Freemasonry. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that we at least touched on him this evening as well, because ben because Banneker uh, plays a very pivotal role in um, the construction of Washington, D.C., the, the very uh, region where my uh, Masonic membership is. Um, although he wasn't a Mason, um, his sense of ast astronomical knowledge was inherited from his African-born grandfather, ban known as Banaka. Um, 
Benjamin Banneker uh, uh, had a, a a very very keen understanding of the stars, which was inherited to him, uh, passed on to him through his white English grandmother, who had been married to Banneker. Okay, um, this was very important throughout his life. Uh, he uh, demonstrated his remarkable uh, scientific intelligence uh, as a young man. He built a wooden clock. Uh, having only seen a clock work one time, uh, and he eventually would go on to publish several editions of his own almanac. Uh, when we think about an almanac, what is that? An almanac is the study of the heavens to be able to predict certain uh, events here on earth as well as in the heavens, to be able to, to predict eclipses and what have you. Banneker was so uh, adept at doing this that he was selected uh, to assist Major Andrew Ellicott in surveying the Federal District of Columbia, okay, and here you see an image at the top uh, from uh, the the book, The Initiated Eye, um, which highlights Masonic art, and you see Banneker uh, sitting there with what's supposed to be Major Andrew Ellicott and President George Washington, a known Freemason, okay, and and, and I don't have to get into all the symbolism in that picture, but there's, there's quite a bit there, okay, uh, to 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 understand, all right. So as I begin to wrap up, let's let's finish off here. And in Washington, D.C., and look at it from a astronomical perspective. Let's look at the Washington Monument from the top down instead of from the bottom up, as we normally do. And what do we see? A certain here in Washington, D.C., there exists a certain point within a circle. The Washington Monument holds deep Masonic and esoteric significance, uh, which I think we've illustrated before. And I won't, out of respect for our, uh, my fellow panelists, uh, I won't get into too deeply tonight unless you want to get into it in Q&A. But it's very interesting. That the Washington Monument uh, was constructed um, with the uh, financial donations of several uh, Masonic Grand Lodges. I think all of them, in fact, all the historically white ones, in fact, um, played a played a significant role in that. It's very significant that they chose to use the model of the uh, obelisk or the Egyptian Tekit or Teknu, um, which is a phallic symbol uh, taken from ancient Egypt uh, to represent George Washington's uh, uh, monument in in the nation's capital. It's also very significant. A lot of people don't know that here in Washington, D.C., no building in the district can ever be built taller than the Washington Monument um, because it has a very special relationship with the sun as well as with Freemasonry. And while I won't give it away, what I will say is this. Um, for those of you who are, who are in the Scottish Rite, um, there are some very special words written somewhere on the Washington Monument. And uh, when you get into understanding why those words are there and where they are placed on the monument, then you will, I th then I believe you will have a better understanding of that certain point of that circle. Not just this point in the circle that exists here below on the earth, but the points and circles that exist in the heavens. And with that being said, I wanna thank you all for your time and your attention. Excellent, excellent. And, and Brother Morgan, your presentation was so good. When we came back um, from it, we were joined by Brother Marshall. Yeah, I see that, wow. <laughs> uh, how you doing, good brother? Hey, I'm doing all right here. Uh, I'm uh, still trying to, uh, navigate my way around StreamYard, but uh, okay. I think I'm starting to figure it out. Uh, good to see you guys, and uh, what I was hearing there was pretty fascinating content. I think a lot of stuff that gets overlooked far too often, so uh, thanks for blessing us with it, James. No problem, Brother Marshall. Glad to see you here. Brother uh, but brother Caffey. Yes, sir. Did, did, did Brother Morgan have the audacity to say uh, that he was worried about uh, coming after me with with his presentation, yes. I believe. I mean, not only not only did he present that, but you know, he was in the big big word category tonight. Circuitous. I mean, we. <laughs> I, mean, he, he, I mean, he was going all out tonight. Look, 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 I start grad school in August. All right, I gotta I gotta start acting like it. All right. <laughs> yeah. Hey. But you know, J James was careful though, because anytime you mention anything about Disney, you got to be careful because they will come after you. So he, he made sure he had those disclaimers on there. <laughs> <laughs>
if you notice, <laughs> if, if you notice, I had a disclaimer for your for your image too, because I don't I don't want you you know oh, yeah, 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 I don't yeah, want. Yeah. <laughs> And I would have sued you too. I would have sued you. I, 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 would, I would too. <laughs> oh, excellent, excellent presentations tonight, good brothers. Um, Brother Marshall, was there anything that you want to add to to what we were talking about the discussion this evening regarding the Saints, John? Uh, well, fellas, I actually had a paper written up about the Saints, John, that I was hoping to read. Uh, but while I was in the the what did they call it backstage uh, here in the app. Uh, when I try to switch over to my document to read, I think it kicks me out. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, I'll at least show the image I was going to share. Do, do you want? Do you want to try to? to it might not have let you do it. It might not have let you do it because I was sharing. If you try it, try it now. Let me see. Since I, since I'm not sharing. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, well, let me ask. So if I wanted to just have an image showing instead of camera footage, what should I try to do? Just just do a, do a screen share like you would. And, uh, uh, and, and I'll, I'll see it now. I'll, I'll, I'll work it for you. All right. I don't think it's uh, giving me the I'm, I'm on my phone here. So I think maybe oh, that's why it's not on the screen share. Probably. That might that be why it's is. not letting me go over to my script, too. Yeah, that's uh, probably a so I'll give it one try here. If it kicks me out, then I'll come back in. Uh, I'm sorry I'm late, guys. It was a. a a, a, what self-centered uh, great uh, teaching lesson for the circumpunct here, right? Uh, but it was a, a self-centered uh, mistake on my part to think that 8 p.m. 8 p.m. my time. Uh, oh, yeah, we should. No, we should have so, clarified that. Yeah, <laughs> that's on us. <laughs> All right, were you uh, were you still able to hear me right there, or did I cut out? Yeah, 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 we can hear you, but I, I didn't see your, your presentation, so you can, you can just go, go roll on ahead and, uh, and we'll work it out. Uh oh, it's frozen. All right, now I'm switching back to you. Did you hear me say my first sentence about St. John the Baptist nope. from the Evangelist? Nope, you, fro you froze up. Just, just, just roll uh, on about it. All right, guys. Uh, well, I'm very sorry. I uh, am so ill prepared for this. Uh, but uh, uh, thanks for inviting me, and uh, I apologize for dropping the ball. I am going to uh, Washington, D.C. in the morning, uh, so uh, in connection to uh, what you had to say there, James, I'm now going to uh, uh, visit the Washington Monument with a different set of eyes uh, based on the information you were sharing there. I, I seem I to recall the last... I will be personally uh, offended if I don't get a phone call. I'll be personally Oh, is offended. that where you are? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm here in DC. I'll, I will be personally offended if I don't see oh, you. Oh yeah. man, yeah, no, let's meet up. Uh, I, uh, uh, I'm planning to hit the Washington uh, Masonic Memorial again there in Alexandria, uh, but really, I'm, I, I've done that. So I, I'd, I'd rather meet up with you to be honest and have some fellowship, or uh, if I could come see your lodge, that'd be even cooler. Uh, yeah. but, uh, uh, I was going to say that I, I seem to recall, and you might have mentioned this. I, I didn't hear it in the part that you talked about with the monument, but the last stone that went into that building was uh, uh, provided by the state of Utah. Each state got to provide one. And on that stone, the marking was Desideret uh, and, and a beehive, uh, which I'm, I'm personally, I'm not Mormon, but that's kind of the uh, the medium through which that Masonic ish influence made its way into the monument on that last stone the beehive symbol of industry and all that uh so that's just one more element of that particular building that has a masonic connection to it and there's so many mm -hmm. right. james let's uh i think we got some questions from certainly, some certainly. of the folks in the audience let's hit those up okay no, no problem at all no problem at all uh, well, let's see here. I know I know we have some good ones in here. I see my good friend Tommy Van Buren representing uh, Arkansas. He's in the house tonight. What's going on, Tommy? Glad to see you here. Okay. Uh, one moment. Okay, so Sister Christine Hackett has a question. She wants to know, does the history of St. John the Baptist and his devotion to Christ mislead members and non-standard to believe the Lodge is a Christian association of men? <laughs> go ahead go ahead brother marshall uh so uh i i somewhat addressed that in the paper that i was hoping to share with you 
that there's pretty solid evidence that the uh, the introduction and then the increased focus on the Saints John uh, in masonry during the uh, 17 and into the 1800s, especially in the mid 1800s, was in response to some of the uh, anti-Masonic vibes that developed in the Catholic Church and other uh, versions of Christianity. It didn't happen with all versions of Christianity. Uh, but but it seems like at least the, 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 the growth of a public presence of the Saints John uh, in Masonry uh, was partially influenced by that, which is to say not so much that they were pretending to be a Christian organization by referencing the Saints John uh, publicly uh, so much as to show, look, uh, elements of Christianity can uh, effectively coexist with what we're doing as Masons. So you church leaders don't need to be quite so afraid of what it is we do in our meetings. Uh, so it, 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 it was at least intended uh, to uh, dispel some of the worries that <laughs> church leaders were having, especially in that era. Uh, and uh, however, now having said that, uh, I do think that not only to people, uh, to, to the question there, uh, not only do sometimes people uh, externally mistake uh, the presence of Saints John or, or other uh, inherently Christian elements to uh, mean that Freemasonry is inherently a Christian organization, but I think it happens internally too. I think, uh, I, heck, I can tell you here in Texas, we've got a lot of lodges and a lot of Masons who uh, mistakenly think that Freemasonry is is inherently uh, or even like exclusively a Christian organization uh, or even a substitute for, for their, their Christian uh, faith or something like that. And, and that's too bad. That's obviously a mistake. That was never the intent. That was never what it was supposed to mean or be. Uh, and I think you guys do a, did a great job there uh, talking uh, about the solstices and how it extends even further back than Christianity as a symbol and, and reference. It's a blending of pre-Christian era and Christian era. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, Brother Powers, I want to throw this next question to you. Brother, yeah. Tommy Van Bier Brother Tommy Van Buren wants to know, has there ever been a specific way that Masons were supposed to celebrate St. John's Day? Yeah, 100 percent. You know, as, as we talked about in the beginning, uh, traditionally, Masons would celebrate the St. John's Day through a traditional feast, being that of a, a table lodge, festive board setting, um, breaking bread with your brothers. So. Awesome. Let's see here. And matter of fact, and I'll, I'll add um, one thing in there that I think is really interesting um, that I've seen. I've seen it written in some Masonic constitutions that um, brothers are either to, on those days, on the, on the St. John Day, either they are supposed to be attending a St. John Day for their particular Grand Lodge or whatever Grand Lodge is closest to them um, when mm -hmm. possible. Um, I, I don't know. Has anyone else ever seen that before? Yeah. And I'll yeah. Uh, add in uh, the 1881 Constitution for my Grand Lodge. It stated specifically uh, like in today's time, we have one annual session. Then we had two. Uh, and those two sessions were to be held on June 24th and December 27th. Mm -hmm. So they held those, those, those dates in high esteem in the Grand Lodge. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we also have like the Grand Lodge of England, you know, uh, the, the first Grand Lodge of England that came out was uh, was set up on the first St. John Day. And then when they came together and, and merged the ancients and the modern into the United Grand Lodge, uh, it was on St. John's Day as well. I, I forget which one was which, but uh, you see that cool, that circumambulation there as well. I believe it was in the I believe it was um, the December uh, St. John's, uh, uh, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. I believe that's what it was but also um uh it's also um when we talked about in the constitution it's also uh within the scottish right um in a, a particular portion in uh scottish right masonry where you know it states that the uh particular house in masonry or particular body in masonry um scottish right masonry excuse me um which is the uh, lodge of perfection should be open on or near uh june 24th which is um you know saint john's day so Absolutely. Um, Brother Troy Curtis asked, would it be discussed that St. John's are metaphors for the solstices and the symbol at the point within a circle is the ancient symbol for the sun or Ra? Uh, I like to think that I that I touched on that uh, pretty good. Um, if, if not, I, uh, uh, please let me know. 
Um, but does anyone else have anything they want to add as far as uh, St. John's Day and the solstices and the, the astronomical aspect of, of, of St. John's Day? Yeah, I think you, I think you touched on it pretty well. Okay. Well, well that's, yeah, that's what absolutely. I get for trying to, that's what I get trying to follow in Damien Jack's footsteps. You know, you get. Stop that. Stop that. Stop <laughs> that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we're going to go down, down, down. Uh, someone asked what was the name of the movie that I referenced, and it was Agora, Agora A-G-O-R-A is the name of the film that I uh, that I referenced in here uh, today. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Medi Demings says, I think she was referring back to, to when I mentioned Kunta Kintan Roots about it being African tradition that a child uh, uh, and their name was revealed to the world as the start of a, a continuing legacy, uh, which I think is uh, is very cool. Um, thank you. For, thank you for sharing that. Um, as well. Um, and uh, let's see. And then, oh, and then someone asked, and Alton Wiseman asked, how often are these live chats? I think that's a very important question. Mm -hmm. Alton must be new. But the cafe, you want to tell them how often these live chats are? These live <laughs> chats are monthly. Uh, we've been doing this uh, since 2015. And actually, we're coming up, I believe, in September on our se seventh year. Yeah, we'll be coming up on our set of the year. So usually we um, conduct these on the last Sunday of the month. Um, we wanted to, you know, we, we had a special date, um, date and time this month. But generally, they occur each each uh, each month, the last Sunday of each month. So please continue to join us, subscribe, so you can get uh, updates. And, you know, definitely, in it. and also, if you're not a member of our um, Facebook page, please, please, uh, Join that as well, so you can stay up to date and continue Absolutely. the conversation. Absolutely. Now, 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 y'all know last year with COVID nineteen that everybody was doing verses. You know, they had this one versus that one. For, so now we got Dave Gillarm, and now we've got Super Dave. And Super Dave wants to know which Saint John uh, <laughs> is in June, which one is in December, and why. I almost feel like I want to ask which Dave is which. Wh who's the real Super Dave? But we won't go there. Elias. Right. right. <laughs> Uh, so, so brother, uh, brother, Mar um, brother Powers, brother Marshall, you, you, you guys want to take this? Uh, which St. John's Day is on what day, and and why do we celebrate them on those particular days? Why not the other way around? Well, I, I can give you the answer that that I was given early on. <laughs> okay. uh, it's it's kind of a funny allegory to uh, remember such, uh, and, and the whole question was. Um, why is the Baptist or St. John the Baptist held in the summer? It's because nobody wants to get baptized in the wintertime. And that's why it was always given to me is, you know, you don't want to go in that freezing cold water. <laughs> as far as uh, why they were actually on those days, you know, I'm not 100% sure, to be honest. Uh, from, from the resource, I can't really get into the... Um, as far as Saint, as far as Saint John the Evangelist, but I know uh, Saint John the uh, the Baptist, um, June June twenty fourth usually has to do with the uh, what they call the Nativity of uh, Saint John the Baptist. So basically, it, it it the feast is celebrating the the, the birth of John the Baptist, um, and there's another feast which happens at the end of August, I believe, uh, August 29th, which um, commemorates the beheading of um john the baptist so in in uh certain faiths you have those that have that 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 celebrate the life and then later on celebrate the death um of uh john the baptist and of course like we uh, like we said the 24th and the 27th being the you know being the summer and winter solstice but um as far as john as far as john the baptist he has actually multiple um feasts which are uh which are celebrated so you have multiple for him and then the one for uh johnny evangelist thank you but, but again, oh, oh yeah to, to my understanding uh saint john evangelist was this, is celebrating december because because he was apostle in the close proximity to jesus that's to my understanding why john the evangelist is in december and brother marshall uh it, so uh I, I would think that the that, that the uh, the virtues that each of those patron saints represented in, in early masonry might speak to something about the location of their dates. So we have uh, St. John uh, the Baptist uh, uh, in 
I, I don't want to get this back, but St. John the Baptist in June, St. John the Evangelist in, in December, uh, one representing uh, the virtue of zeal, the other representing a virtue of studiousness and, and, and a preparatory nature. Uh, in the wintertime, on the day of the sh shortest amount of sunlight, uh, your zeal, uh, your, your, your fervency to work and, and, and celebrate and what have you really, I mean, what, what's to celebrate? It's the darkest day of the year. Uh, there's nothing to get from your crops, you know, going back to the, uh, the uh, solstices and, and uh, pagan or pre-Christian era. Uh, but, but, but you can prepare and you can uh, lean into the promise of what's to come and study, which, which would align well with uh, St. John the Evangelist telling you, you know, it's, it's coming. Uh, something good is coming. Let's wait. Uh, and, and then St. John the Baptist with the zeal, uh, it's here. Uh, now is the time to reap the harvest. Uh, now is the time to celebrate. We, this is what we've been waiting for. Uh, we have all the light we can get. Uh, and, and so I think you've got a location of those days and an identification of those, those patron saints whose virtues uh, are either zeal or kind of a studious uh, a preparatory uh, role. Uh, fit well with what those dates have always meant, even going back into antiquity. Hmm. Hey, go ahead, Brother Powers. Yeah, you know, Brother Marshall, I think that's an excellent point to bring up because, you know, as we sit here and talk about the the Saints of John, uh, we've also got to, you know, understand to a large degree there that, you know, when it, when it comes to the symbolisms that we're talking about, they they're essentially to a large degree placeholders for the, the allegory and the, the symbolism behind um, which, which I thought was pretty fantastic. Uh, and brother Morgan's uh, presentation tonight, he brought up the, uh, and I'm, I'm going to kill the name. If I try to remember here, the Bacongo Cosmogram. Is that? Yeah, you said it right. Okay. It, it, it was the African circle of life. And that was awesome to see. I've not seen that particular uh, uh, manifestation of that um, symbolism prior. So it was beautiful to see that. But remembering in the fact that we do see that symbolism all around and same with the Saints John's, you know, wh what they're symbolizing there is, is the solstices. And what we really have to understand, especially talking about the uh, the Agora film and the, the lead character there, the lady, um, you mentioned, you know, not being traditionally a Mason, so, uh, so to speak, but being very well uh, versed in those universal truths. That's exactly what all this gets down to is, you know, Freemasonry never claimed, although I think some people take it word for word out of the book, uh, never claimed to be the source or 100 um, percent book accurate. Right. It, it says right up front. This is this is allegory to get a point across, to teach you a lesson and a story behind. So many people get lost in the story at hand. And no, we, we built King Solomon's Temple and that's exactly where we started. And that's all there is. There's, you're missing so much behind that and uh, that that allegory, that symbolism behind those universal truths that are not uh, primarily or, uh, you know, 100 percent uh, indiscriminately Masonic by any means. Um, but we see them across many, many uh, systems of of. Uh, oh, systems of, of, of research, of, of, of truth and knowledge. Um, that that's where the true uh, the true path is uh, that we need to be talking about. So yeah, it's it's Absolutely. fantastic for you to bring that up. Thank you. I, I I completely agree with you. And you know, for me, that's why why I wanted to make sure I mentioned that film. Um, I uh, don't know a whole lot of people that have seen it, um, and there's a reason for that. The the movie was uh, considered very interesting. Is actually considered um, anti-Christian by some uh, activists, you know, groups here in the States. And so it went straight to DVD in the United States, but it, it was, uh, it was a I think it was Spanish, it was a Spanish produced film. The film it's in English though, for, for, I don't want to turn anyone off, um, but it was, I think produced and directed by, some, by a Spanish film company. And so it aired over there in, the, in theaters, but then it came straight to DVD here. But to me, it was like, it's an amazing film, um, especially for those of us who are interested in Freemasonry or similar related topics, um, you know, and thinking about the life of Hypatia as it's portrayed, and you know, she's you see her there studying in the temple, she has students, and they're all trying to really work out these uh mathematical and scientific problems as well as the politics of their day, right? Um, I think that sometimes we lose that, um, 
in the commercialization of Freemasonry, I think sometimes we lose the essence of it, which goes back to really understanding the physical, the spiritual, the psychological world around us. Um, and you know, and, and that's why I always love every time we we finish off on these episodes, I'm sure he's gonna say it again today. Uh, brother brother Kathy always likes to say, let's make sure we teach Freemasonry in our lodges. I think that that's such a key principle. You know, um, Freemasonry is more than just knowing the allegory. It's more than just knowing the right amount of steps of steps to take and whatnot. It's really being able to take the lessons that Freemasonry tries to communicate to you and to be able to see them in the world around us. You know, and that's why when we decided to do this topic, I really wanted to focus in on on the circles that run our lives. You know, I mean, literally, the thing when you think about the how powerful the sun is, mm. think about the symbolism of the sun and the moon as it relates to Freemasonry, right? I mean, and in and, and stars as well. What is a star? But, you know, a star is is, is a sun. It's a, it's, our sun is a star. Is a star. It just happens to be the closest one to us. So when we think about the symbol of, of the, the symbolism of all these astronomical bodies and how they relate to Freemasonry, I really wish that we spent more time on them um, because I think it's, it's you know, if, if you don't understand that part, you know, you're, you're missing a step. And I, and I use that phrase for a reason because i love the middle chamber so uh you're literally missing a step if you don't deal with the, the astronomical aspect of it true indeed did that conclude the questions brother morgan i believe let me just make sure i don't want to skip nobody but let me just make sure i think we're pretty i think we're pretty good on yep 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 well, I know uh, it looks like we got a lot of requests for Brother Marshall's um, paper. <laughs> they want to know how they can get a hold of that. So, if, you know. if uh, I was just thinking uh, an idea, and one thing I'll, I will do here is I'll at least show an image that I talk about in, in the paper at large. This is a, a thousand year old image from Hildegard of Bingen. She was a, a, a Christian a theologian and philosopher, uh, but. Uh, uh, you can see here, it's, it's, it's kind of, you could think of it as a prototype of the circumpunct. You've got uh, uh, a human or uh, a version of Adam or what have you there at the center. Uh, uh, this also later influences da Vinci's uh, version of the Vitruvian man. Uh, and of course, like I said, uh, the circumpunct to some degree. Uh, you've got at the edge of the cosmos there, uh, and, and the world as we know it, that, that red figure representing the Holy Ghost, uh, and then even beyond the cosmos as we know it, the uh, uh, figurehead or, or father uh, of deity, right? Uh, and so this was an understanding, uh, as, as Brother uh, Morgan was talking about, uh, of the, the physical, spiritual, and uh, philosophical views of, of reality itself all kind of being blended and interconnected in a way uh, that alchemically was referred to as within, without, uh, or uh, above, below, those, those kinds of reflective properties that all of reality, including very selves, our, our own anatomy was to uh, have within them. And the circumpunct uh, uh, book ended by the Saints John and, and kind of baptized, if you will, uh, by the, the the appearance of the Saint John on either side of it uh, was meant to kind of introduce some of those ideas to people who were predominantly Christian, but not entirely Christian. We do know that there were Jewish people and Muslim people in the uh, coffee houses where uh, early lodges in England and Europe were meeting. So uh, it wasn't quite as religiously homogenous as we're often led to believe or think about. Um, now, what I was thinking about the uh, what I had to say as a paper. Uh, uh, if you guys would be amenable to it, and I hate to put you on the spot like this while we're live, but uh, I could I could perhaps uh, uh, film uh, myself uh, reading that just as I would have for this, and then I can send it to you guys, and y'all can share it however you want to share it uh, through Prince Hall Think Tank. Perfect. Okay. That that sounds like an exclusive video. Watch <laughs> me. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll make sure as James did to put the disclaimer. On the bottom. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> oh, please do. I have to put a disclaimer on everything I do here in Texas because if I just sneeze in a Masonic lecture, there's somebody wanting to bring me up on charges. <laughs> oh, Lord. 
Oh, Lord, no, we don't want that. We don't. We don't. We don't want that. We don't want don't that. Want that. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. <laughs> which, 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 remi- which reminds me that uh, the views and opinions expressed here on the Prince All Think Tank in no way, shape, or form represent the lodges or grand lodges that we claim that we may hold membership in. I, I think I heard that somewhere before. I heard yeah, that I somewhere like, before. I just feel like saying it again. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> to, to do it twice tonight. <laughs> All right. Let's go to uh, our 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 closing. Uh, our closing thoughts. Uh, let's start with Brother Powers. Yeah, definitely. You know, first of all, I just want to, you know, again, thank you guys for having me on. Such a blessing to spend the evening with all you gents and and all the guests out there as well, dropping the questions. Uh, it's It's been very enlightening, uh, very enjoyable to have this conversation. Uh, you know, I, I guess the big question here, right, is uh, we, we hear so often, uh, why Saints John? Uh, being the fact that, you know, they're they're known to be Christian saints. And I, I think a lot of guys, we, we talked about this a little earlier, to, you know, do people confuse Freemasonry to be uh, majority Christian for that reason? And, you know, not everybody, but I definitely think uh, people ran with it during the time just because uh, there's, you know, periods of time when the mass majority of those involved were of that nature. And it was it was made more palatable um, by introducing uh introducing those wordings and those, those connections on that deeper level. Uh, what was it? The, uh, the, the early Preston work, it was like 1770, something like that. Uh, the early Preston work, there was actually a different EA lecture and obviously not going to get into the whole thing there, but he ends up the EA lecture, uh, answering that, you know, the, the Saints John are to be, uh, or all lodges within Christian countries specifically, are to be dedicated to the Saints John, which always, you know, brought up a question to me of, you know, in that time period or thereafter outside in, in non, uh, you know, quote unquote Christian countries, uh, wondering if there was any other uh, dedications of that nature. Um, it, it's an interesting topic, you know, but were they specifically placed there because of Christianity? In my personal opinion, I, I don't think so. Um, I, I think honestly, it's, you know, we like to attribute things very easily and, and make things what we're comfortable with and being. Um, honestly, I, I think it's the allegory in play that fits so well to make that connection. You know, as I said early in the beginning, we don't know, at least, you know, I haven't found a date of where the Saints John, because uh, you know, originally there was one, the other one was added on at another later point, uh, but was attributed to Freemasonry. That connection was made because we see it in connection well before the the establishment of the Grand Lodge system itself. Uh, we we hear references of St. John's Lodges, of St. John's Masons, Masons that weren't even associated with lodges at the time. Um, so it, it goes back very, very far. Um, I do think over time, though, um, you know, that the whole fact of making it more palatable for the uh, the main demographic, it, it took on a heavier Christian cognitation, I guess you could say, even up to more modern times, uh, early years of Grand Lodge of Kansas. You go into the uh, Grand Master's uh, uh, speeches to the uh, to the body of the jurisdiction, and he'll say in there numerous times about our Christian tenants and our Christian Masons and, and very open in that connection, uh, that front. The one thing I, I guess I would say there is by strictly seeing that connection, um, you lose and you sacrifice pointing out so much of the allegory behind it, which as we see through our degrees, the fact that this story is not the cut and dry story. We're telling the story as an allegory to tell you another story, right? You got to see that bigger picture, open your eyes to it. So if we're only seeing that one connection and we're not understanding why beyond that, those universal truths, uh, just as we see symbols and different, uh, different faith points and different marks around the world that, that hold the same meaning uh, through different eras, through different ways, if we, if we uh, focus on that specific connection and we fail to see that, then we're missing so much of the story. So I, you know, personally, thank you guys so much for having me on here this evening. It's been a blast and hope to come back and chat again. One more thing, I guess I could throw in here. Sorry. If you guys ever make it to Kansas city, come see me. The Nelson Atkins museum here actually has, well, they claim it to be the finger of St. John the Baptist. I don't know if it's really him. It's been <laughs> tested to be from that period, 
but it's pretty dang cool. It's in a shrine, all gold, little glass deal, and there is still a finger that you can see. Uh, so if you're out here, come check it out. Wow. And, 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 and just for the record, we did not know that that was in Kansas and that wasn't the reason why we asked Brother Powers to be on this evening, <laughs> but we love the connection. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. <laughs> Brother Marshall, closing thoughts, sir. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, so a couple things I'll throw in. Uh, I'll also say that the Nelson Atkins in Kansas City uh, has my favorite painting of a St. John. It's by Caravaggio, uh, the master of light in, in the uh, uh, long list of uh, uh, master painters uh, and it, it shows a St. John uh, moving out of darkness into light and uh, it's an absolutely moving piece. Uh, so see a St. John finger and see one of uh, history's greatest depictions of a St. John on canvas as well. Um, uh, I, I, I Something uh, I think, I, I know I have fun doing it. I don't know if Alex does. For those uh, watching who aren't aware, uh, Alex and I our, our co-hosts on uh, the Historical Light Masonic Podcast Project, which he started several years ago and then brought me on later, uh, probably against uh, uh, good judgment. But uh, big mistake. Uh, one thing I have fun doing is uh, pestering him by disagreeing with him on things. And something I'll disagree with him uh, here on is I do think the Saints John were, uh, I, I, I don't know if I'd say introduced because of the Christian uh, thing, but uh, it, that aspect of masonry was definitely enhanced, built upon, uh, and, and enlarged because of the Christian aspect. Again, I, I, I believe for the reasons I was saying earlier, as, as a response to uh, Christian churches' uh, uh, anti-Masonic rhetoric uh, about us being somehow anti-Christian or unchristian or something like that, and as a way of showing uh, here are some Christian saints that we honor every year publicly. Uh, so you can't say we're entirely unchristian if, if this is something we're doing on a regular basis. Uh, uh, but uh, it sounded like uh, where I'm, I'll get back to agreeing with Alex. Uh, it sounded like he was alluding to some of the uh, very, very old uh, connections between uh, the building trade of masonry and one of the saints, John, as a, a, a patron saint. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the there, there also seems to have been at least one lodge that met in a St. John Tavern, uh, which had connections to a St. John Church uh, uh, nearby uh, in that early era. Uh, and we very well could have that in our ritual uh, because that lodge or a similar lodge uh, itself had that in their version uh, because they were literally a lodge of uh, St. John with a connection to a church they had built or a pub they were meeting in with that name or something along those lines, which would be a practical, less interesting uh, connection. Uh, and um, the more interesting and allegorical uh, way of, of corresponding the Saints John as the church did by uh, locating their feast days on the solstices uh, is, is really, I, I think, the bread and butter of masonry. Uh, and an earlier dedication, uh, and, and, and like the Preston lectures or elsewhere, uh, we see uh, when they start to introduce information about the Saints John, they will often preface it by saying, we weren't always dedicated to the Saints John. We used to be dedicated to Moses or Noah uh, and uh, figures like that who uh, obviously weren't Christian, which bolstered, sorry, my Charger came unplugged, so I'm fixing it. I'm talking. Bolsters Alex's point that it, the whole message isn't a, inherently a Christian message, which is obviously true. Uh, and then uh, uh, heading down that path can get us onto a whole different sort of uh, uh, rabbit hole of the Mosaic and Noachide traditions, which I know you guys have covered before. I've seen uh, y'all talking about it on the Prince Hall Think Tank. Uh, so, uh, uh, with that, I will say, uh, as part of my sign off, that if you're a Mason or you're connected to Masonry in some way out there, uh, I hope that uh, in considering the Saints John tonight uh, with the guys here at the Prince Hall Think Tank, uh, I hope you'll you'll go back to your lodges this week or next week or or the next time you're there 
with a more intentional desire to uh, emulate the zeal uh, of, of St. John, uh, uh, which is the virtue that we were called to emulate this time of year as Masons, uh, by uh, supporting uh, the Master of Your Lodge or your Lodge's projects or in whatever way that you can uh, emulate zeal. Uh, no matter where you are uh, or when you are in the Masonic timeline, uh, no Lodge uh, ever has too much zeal. So whatever you can uh, provide, I hope you do. And uh, thanks for having me on. I know I was late. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I look forward to watching uh, after this is uh, over and, and catching up to everything you guys were sharing. Appreciate that, Brother Marshall. Before we go to Brother Morgan, and you, you know, mentioned it, and I, I wanted to mention it too. If anyone wanted to um, check out the podcast, how can they do that? Uh, Historicallight.com. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. Uh, we, uh, we have our video side on YouTube, and then the audio sides uh, syndicated across all major networks. So, uh, Find historicallight.com. You'll be connected to everything. Okay. Appreciate that. So please, uh, folks in the audience, go check that out. Brother Morgan, closing thoughts. You're on mute, brother. First of all, let me just say I am honored that uh, we could have Brother Marshall and Brother Powers on here. Um I have known um, brother. I've known of brother Marshall for a while, but I think this is our first time kind of connecting. But I've known brother Powers for quite some time since he got historical light started. And many moons ago, uh, he uh, uh, interviewed me about a little research paper that I had written about the history of uh, of, of black Freemasonry in Kansas. Uh, Hold on, did that, you say little? Okay, okay, it was, it was, it was, it was a couple did. sentences. He did. It was a couple sentences, you know, uh, and, and that that uh, work, as, as, as most all of you know, has, has gone on to become a book. Um, I know that um, Brother Brother Marshall is a humble man. And so he did he did not. I don't think he, I heard him mention that he himself is an author as well and, and published the history of uh, Gardner Lodge uh, a, a couple years back as well. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. When I was uh, when I was master in 2018, uh, I went through and I. I'm, I'm sure I, from what I remember talking about your research, you, you started that for a family reunion deal. So it was intended right. to be much smaller. And right. that was the exact same thing. Uh, when we had our 150th anniversary, I was master. We had a previous history book pamphlet um, that was written on our 100 year anniversary. My plan was to bring it up to date, started finding out that there was all kinds of missing information. So I said, oh, we're going to make it a website. And then it just became a 700 page book and brother Morgan knows how that goes. <laughs> well, I know how a 500 page book goes. you got 700 pages. So, and then brother Jack's books aren't as long, but he got like 50, 11,000 of them. So, you know, we, we out here, we out, we out here uh, uh, with these books. So make sure y'all support brother powers books. Make sure y'all support brother Jack's book. Make sure y'all support brother Marshall, brother Gillard, brother Caffey's book when they drop them and they movies and everything else, you know, I, I heard that her Dave is going to be in the next fast and furious movie. Don't tell nobody. I told y'all that. Right. But, but we, we out here. Um, matter of fact, one last thing before I uh, sign off, if y'all don't uh, pardon me for, uh, for the shameless plug, but I will be um, a guest on the labyrinth uh, podcast with sister Darnisha Pickett. Uh, she wants to talk to me about strategies and methodologies of writing. Uh, so that's going to air on uh, on Sunday, July 18th, 2021. So check your local podcast feed uh, for that. I believe she I believe she uh, posts hers, her podcast on um, on, Sound, on on SoundCloud, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so make sure you all check out the labyrinth July 18th. I'll be on there. And so, so that was a great transition. We talk about books and writing. There we go. So yeah, other than that, I hope everybody enjoys themselves. Uh, happy, well, ha happy belated Juneteenth for those who were celebrating Juneteenth, uh, the first one that's recognized by the federal government, but not the first one ever. Shout out to everybody for that. And then shout out to, uh, for those of us here in the United States who will be celebrating uh, the 4th of July uh, in the next few days. Uh, shout out for that. And also shout out to my, last shout out, I'm sorry. My cousin Tina's birthday is on Friday. And my little brother, my younger, my biological brother, Wade, is turning uh, 28 on Friday as well on, on the 2nd. So if he's 28 and he's my younger brother, how old does that make me? With that being said, see y'all next month. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Thanks, Brother Jack. Yes, sir. As always, um, it is uh, indeed an honor, a pleasure to be before you this evening. Um, thank you to uh, Brother Marshall and Brother Powers uh, for gracing us with your presence this evening. Um, you know, it's one thing that um, that 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 uh, illustrious Albert Pike um, said, and he he was talking about it uh, in terms of uh, Scottish Rite, but I do believe um, it. It ties into what we've been what we've been talking about uh, tonight. Even though he was talking about you know a particular degree and uh, the ceremonies of a particular degree, uh, he basically said, and I'm paraphrasing that if you if you exclude men of of other faiths um, because because of their faiths, you know, in terms of the ceremonies that he was talking about for that degree, then you are absolutely missing the essence of what masonry is um, is all about. So when we talk about um, you know the 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 Saint John, the Saints John, and uh, we talk about the, uh, the the Christian overtones. I know that that it that continues uh, to to be a conversation and a, and, a, and a long-standing conversation. I think a lot of times what we have to uh, what we have to realize we've heard the the word this evening said a lot. The word allegory, and when we talk about the word allegory, what it means basically means is you need to basically look beyond what you see in black and white. And go beyond and 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 learn what what it is beyond you know beyond that story. A lot of times we have a tendency to do things because it's strictly routine. So when we have you know when we have the St. John's Day celebration, you know, and the question is asked, why do we celebrate? You know, a lot of times you you get the worst phrase that 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 you hear in life because that's the way it's always been done, or because that's we we've always been we've always been doing it that way with no actual explanation of. Uh, who it is we are celebrating, why we're celebrating, what are, what is the symbolism behind them, and what what can we learn from them? So at a, so when we when you look at that, we you basically have to you know peel peel the onion and look behind the layers of what you see um, to 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 get an understanding, and you know always hopefully you know um, understand that, and and it has been said you know over and over again you know that that Freemasonry does not you know adopt a particular creed. So also although you may you know see and. Uh, you may see an overtone, you know, do do understand that there are lessons of other faiths that that, you know, tie into um, this 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 time honored institution called Freemasonry. So I do hope that by this evening, this evening's presentations, um, you haven't you know, you do have that understanding um, that there are other faiths who, you know, look at, you know, maybe not St. John the Evangelist, but St. John the Baptist, what you know, what he represents um to to each faith and what what he means uh to those who practice a, a particular faith um as always it you know again it, it has been a pleasure i thank you for um taking your time you know like like i always say the biggest thing that you can give somebody is your time because that's something that you can't get back so thank you for uh thank you for your time look forward to uh seeing you next month um the most important month uh, which is July because that's that's the month that I was born. So you know we getting we we getting into the most important month of the year. So looking forward to seeing you. Oh, and 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 James, you know as far as Dave's uh, appearance in, in Fast and Furious, you know I heard that he put in his contract that he could not be in the movie without having some type of Knicks jersey. So you know we got to make sure we you know we look for that. So to yeah. all, thank you and see you next month. So that's why the movie took so long to come out. Absolutely, it? absolutely. Oh, it wasn't okay. the pandemic. It wasn't the pandemic. Oh. It's because of the jersey. Oh, that makes sense. And that's that's why they end up in outer space somewhere because they gotta go find it. Is they gotta go find yeah. the championship? They gotta the find right? it, right? And without further ado, the incredible Dave Gillard Jr. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, he was oh, Dave. Then we had Super Dave. And now he's like, now he's the incredible Dave. That's what we're going yeah. on tonight. Okay, it's levels to this. Yeah, definitely. Uh, oh man. Uh, so since we're talking about Christian themes, uh, those are I, I think I've spoken about it on uh, on the show. And the ones that know me, but one of the biggest ones in my life was my grandfather, Bishop Ari Dickinson Senior. So on Sundays, after another preacher would come up to the podium, or after the preacher preach, he would come up to the podium, and he would always say, "If that didn't light you on fire, then your wood is wet." So after watching tonight's show. If this show didn't light you on fire, that means that your wood is wet. You might need to go back to the preparation room and uh, figure some things out. 
because uh, this this show definitely inspired me. Uh, and the Pat uh, brother James on the back, I believe during uh, while brother Kathy was on vacation, I think it was two groups that he mentioned that he wanted to work with, and uh, the Historical Light Podcast was one of them. Uh, he 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 mentioned that over and over when you do something with the Historical Light Podcast. Uh, so we watched them, man. They all, y'all y'all some awesome brothers. So to see this come to light is um is is it's, it's a great thing. And you you brothers do some awesome work. Um, and then y'all y'all know how this is going in. Y'all y'all already know. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I I was determined not to say. Well, before I say that, uh, while brother James was talking about movies, actually. Do have a have a a meeting about another movie, uh, so once that stuff comes out, I'll be sure to let everybody know. It's gonna instead of like how Terra Masonica was uh, with uh, more document. Well, when I was in Terra Masonica, and that was documentary. Uh, this one is gonna be more docudrama. drama, um, and it's gonna be. I can't really give too many details about it, but we're looking at at least three seasons of it. So it's gonna be. It's going to be something that, that that we've been asking for for a long time, uh, but I will keep everybody posted about it. Are you going to be in the new Lord of the Rings? <laughs> I, I may be. Game of Thrones. Or is it it Game may Thrones? be, but it's the only new Shaft. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it, but it's all Prince Hall related. Well, it's strictly about Prince Hall Masonry, so it's going to be it's going to be something very very interesting. John John Shaft Lodge number seventy five. Nineteen twenty-five. Is that what it is? Okay. Go ahead. And, and I was determined not to say anything about the Knicks tonight. I was not going to do it. I even had my Knicks pin on. I took it off. But as James thought, talked about the circle of life, how everything comes back around. Lord, the circle has never ended. Um, this just happened to show up. I did see that. <laughs> Y'all see that? Hold on. Let me, let me go back. Y'all see that? Y'all see it? Thank you, Lance. And, and shout out to Brother Boss. Like, it's like Brother Boss is awesome. And it's just ironic that he, when he was in Alaska, uh, I was up there visiting them on their St. John's Day. Um, so be, having St. John's Day in Alaska was, was great. Brother Powers, I will be in Kansas City July 28th. So I will touch base with you then. Um, so you see how the universe works? I didn't even plan on saying anything, and it just appeared. I'm so, trying to figure out. Wait, wait. I'm trying to figure out how you got admin privileges. I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> <I thought it's- laughs> well, when you're a big movie star, <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was the only one with admin privileges. <laughs> no, no, yeah, yeah well, that, that, that's all I got. It's, it's a pleasure being uh, uh, tonight. I always have fun with you, brothers. <laughs> Thanks, brothers. I'm, I'm, I'm really confused. Like, I, right, I mean, just, for, for those who watch the show, y'all know I usually handle the admin stuff behind the scenes. I really feel like some type of way right now. Like they've got admin privileges. I'm going to hey, rethink my whole life right now. God, he he cannot be stopped. You can only hope to contain him. Right. <laughs> thanks, brothers. And again, thanks, uh, Brother Powers and Brother Marshall for joining us this evening. You definitely added a great element to um, the discussion. And, you know, we, we, we've we talked about it uh, not only on this show, but a, a lot of our shows. You know, it, it's really important to not only, you know, study the, the, the particular object. So not only to study the lives of uh, St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist, but, you know, um, really study what they symbolize. You know, you're the, and it was mentioned earlier, you know, you're the particular point within the circle. You know, understand what that means. You know, understand what that circle means. Understand what the line means. This is how you really improve yourself in masonry by study and, and, and ultimately yourself. Because I always said masonry is just a simple study of self. So if you really, really want to improve yourself, you need to understand what the metaphors within the craft means to really unlock that world of um, self-improvement tools. So we urge always, we urge all of you to do that. Thanks for joining us tonight. We hope you gain a little insight and we hope you join us for future episodes. Have a good evening. And remember, as always, let's teach masonry in our lodges. Have a great evening and be safe.